Good morning. I guess we'll get started. It's 8.30. So, hello and good morning. My name is Ann Schultz. I'd like to welcome those of you who are attending in person and also extend a welcome to the people we have attending online via the webinar. Today, it's my pleasure to share with you information about enhancements to the WCB's rate-making model. Today, we will be reviewing the impact of the rate model changes by looking at what would have happened in 2017 had we implemented the new model in 2017 as compared to the actual 2017 rates under the old model or the current process. The comparison of the 2017 old to new model will give you a sense of the magnitude of the changes for your rate codes. This morning, we're going to be talking about uh, the codes S11, S12, and S41. So S11 is legal, financial, and drafting offices. S12 is professional offices. And S41 is engineering, testing, and surveying. We're not going to be giving you your 2018 rates today, as the data to complete those calculations is not yet available. So we have a bit of an agenda we will be uh, going through in today's presentation. The first item will be a little bit about WCB and why we <coughs> exist. Then we'll be reviewing why we did the rate model review. And then going through the impact of the enhancements to the rate model for your rate codes. And then talking a little bit about next steps. So we have previously shared some of the information you're going to be seeing today at regional education meetings that we held in November and December um, in Regina, Saskatoon, Yorkton, Prince Albert, and I think that was the four locations that we went to. These presentations and the webinars uh, that resulted from them are available online, as well as the full report from the consultant actuary that we use to help us review our rate model. So if you need some more information or, or would like to um, just look a few things up that we'll be reviewing today, you may find additional information in those reports that are online. <coughs> so why do we pay WCB premiums? Before 1915, if a worker was injured, his only recourse was to sue his employer. Often he couldn't afford to sue the employer, so he just would be injured at home, not working, and have medical expenses. If he was able to sue, he was often not successful. And if he was successful, often the court-ordered restitution would be huge financial burdens for the employers, often resulting, resulting in bankruptcy of that company. So injured workers without benefits were unable to work and became a burden on government with respect to support through social security programs. In Canada, in, in Ontario, in the early 1900s, government recognized the problem of the increasing cost to government for social benefits related to injury injuries caused in the workplace. And based on what was happening in Germany at the time, where they had already developed a compensation system, the Ontario government commissioned a study. Sir William Meredith is the fellow they contracted to do the study, and he crafted a workers' compensation model that he called the historic compromise. This compromise meant that workers gave up the right to sue in exchange for medical and wage loss benefits, while employers would assume the cost of the system in, ex in exchange for protection from legal action. All jurisdictions across Canada, and in fact across the world, have adopted the model and have their own workers' compensation legislation. Our legislation here in, in Saskatchewan was enacted in 1929. So the legislation has evolved over the years. However, the principles upon which it was designed 
continue to form the foundation of the systems today. So Meredith, when he did his study, came up with five principles which have become to be known as the Meredith principles. The cornerstone principle is that it is a no-fault compensation system, which means workers are paid benefits regardless of how the injury occurred. There is no argument over responsibility or liability for injuries, and workers and employers waive the right to sue. The next important principle that Meredith came up, was, up with was that there had to be security of benefits, which means that a fund must be established to guarantee funds to pay benefits for the current year and into future years, because often injuries last beyond the current year. In fact, the legislation in Saskatchewan requires the WCB to be 100% funded. In addition to these principles, the other very important principle is the concept of collective liability, which means that covered employers, on the whole, share liability for workers for workplace injury insurance. And the total cost of the compensation system is shared by all employers. All employers will contribute to a common fund, and the financial liability becomes their collective liability. This is the foundation of all insurance plans, including the workers' compensation plan. So it's no different than the car insurance or house insurance that you purchase personally. So when you purchase house insurance, you're sharing in the collective liability to the risk pool that you're assigned to, should excessive claims happen in that area. The other two principles that Meredith outlined have to do with how the system should be run. He said there should be independent administration, which means that the, sorry, the organizations who administer the workers' compensation insurance should be separate from government to avoid political interference in things like rate setting or determination of entitlement to benefit. He also said that workers' compensation boards should have exclusive jurisdiction all compensation claims should be directed to the compensation board, and the board is the decision maker and final authority for all claims. This principle also supports the concept of collective liability, security of benefits, and ensured robust systems. These principles continue to be valid today and support compensation programs across the world. So next, we'll just go over a little bit our, about our rate setting process. So it's basically a three-step process. The main objective of the rate setting process is to ensure that we collect enough premiums for future costs of today's claims. So if someone gets injured today, if they're a young person, that claim could have costs running out 50 years into the future. The overall premium requirements for the W sub CB for the coming year need to be met. Premiums should cover all current and future costs for claims from employers operating during the year. So the first step in the rate setting process is the classification process. With classification, we have approximately 47,000 employers in the province who are covered by WCB. They are assigned to a risk pool based on their business undertaking. In Saskatchewan, we have 50 of those risk pools that are called rate codes. So this forms the basis of the, uh, the first step. You're assigned to a risk pool, you will share in the costs of that risk pool. <clears throat> the second step is determination of the industry premium rate. So it's the premium rate at that code level. The collective experience of all the employers in each industry rate code determines that industry's premium rate. All employers in the same rate code start with the same industry premium rate and share in the cost of the injuries that occur in that rate code. <clears throat> 
once we establish that base industry rate, the next step is the experience rating program. At this level, we consider an individual employer's experience, and depending on that experience, that employer will be assigned either a surcharge or receive a discount based, uh, that surcharge or discount gets applied to that base rate that's set in step two. We have two kind of sub-programs underneath the experience rating program. The standard program is for smaller employers and the advanced program is for larger employers. The standard program for employers has a cutoff of $21,000 in premiums for three years. So in three years, if your premiums are less than $21,000, you will be ass assigned to the standard program. The standard program is based on frequency of claims. So it, it depends on the number of time loss count claims that you have. Depending on that, you can receive either a maximum discount of 25% or a maximum surcharge of 75%. Approximately 88% of the employers in Saskatchewan belong to the small program or the standard program. The advanced program is a cost-based program for larger employers with premiums that exceed $21,000 over a three-year period. So individual employers in the advanced program are compared to other employers in their, in their industry. And if they're better, they will receive a discount. If they are worse, based on their costs, they will receive a surcharge. The maximum discount is 30%, while the maximum surcharge is 200%. So that's quite a wide range um, that could be applied to the base industry rate. So in summary, you get assigned to a risk pool, we calculate the rate for that risk pool, and then we look at your own experience to either apply a surcharge or discount to come to your net rate. So why did we do the rate model review? <coughs> the rate model review came about as a step in the overall review of WCB's financial systems. A few years ago, the board had a review done of the investments we own. When we set rates, premium rates, we assume that we will earn a rate of return on our investments to ensure that funds are available to pay the cost of injuries into the future. These costs could be paid out over the next 50 years if a young person is injured. They could be on benefits till they're age 65. So we need to run out what those costs might be 50 years into the future. This adheres to the Meredith principle with respect to security of benefits, that we have enough funds to pay the costs of those claims until someone each is, reaches age 65. The investment study considered whether the investments we own will earn the expected rate of return or the, the income that we need over the long term. And also mm -hmm. that study informed the board that we could do some changes to our investment holdings to reduce the volatility of the investment returns. So we had four steps uh, with respect to that exercise to reduce volatility of returns that our income stream was more predictable. And we just completed the last step um, with moving some investments into a global small cap um, manager in January of 2017. Following the investment optimization study, we conducted an asset liability study through an external actuary. So the asset liability study looked at the match of our investments in the income stream from those investments and match that up to the stream of costs or the liability for injuries that are already within our system. So it matched, our assets were matched, the income stream coming in from our assets was matched with um, the income stream or the cost stream, I guess it would be, of our liabilities. 
This is similar to how a pension plan would look at its assets and ensure that they're sufficient to satisfy the liability for those pensions. The AL study also reviewed our rate setting process at a very high level and recommended that we conduct a rate model review. As premiums are the other source of revenue besides investment income that are used to ensure that we have sufficient funds to meet our future claims liability costs. The other reason we did the rate model review is that we had heard from some employer groups that our model was not reactive enough to improvements or changes in injury rates. So Eckler, um, who did our asset liability study and then did our subsequent rate model review, based his review on four competing, sometimes competing and sometimes complementary principles. And these principles are also very much linked to the Meredith principles I talked about earlier. So on the, I guess it would be your left, the scales of justice there have accountability and collective liability. So with accountability, this principle reinforces concepts of fairness and equity and incentive for prevention. So premiums are paid by current employers should cover the cost of their injured workers during the premium period. So those costs, like I said before, could go well into the future. Today's employer should pay for today's injuries. On the other side of the true accountability, so where you know, you're accountable for all of your costs, is the competing principle of collective liability which states that employers as a group and those within the industry are jointly responsible for the workers' compensation costs. And that employers should not be excessively punished for unusually costly claims. Therefore, a portion of these unusually costly claims should be shared by all <laughs> employers. So if you think about the example of your house insurance, if you were to have a catastrophic loss of your home through a fire, you would not be required to repay the entire cost of rebuilding your house. Your insurance would kick in. You wouldn't see that additional cost reflected in next year's premium because the other people in your insurance risk pool helped you pay to recover the cost of your home. And that's similar to workers' compensation. At a level, excessive costs should be shared by all. On the other side of the page, there's also competing <coughs> principles with respect to reactivity and predictability. So what that means is reactivity is that industry should expect quick response when their claims are, and costs are going down. So contradicts with the predictability, which is where employers also want stability of rates. So reactivity would mean that rates would react very quickly to changes, where stability gives you the ability to predict what your rate might be. And we need to balance the volatility of how rates could go with predictability in terms of being able to have a smooth rate transition. And underlaying all of these principles is a principle of transparency, which means that our rate making models should be easy to understand and we should be able to explain them. So with, throughout the review, Eckler approached review of the various elements of our rate model, trying to seek an appropriate balance of the above principles in a transparent way. So what was critical to the review process? To maintain high levels of fairness and transparency overall in the rate setting process, we want to be able to predict how much revenue we need to collect to pay for the cost of today's injuries. The model needs to generate enough premiums to fund the system in a fair and equitable way. The other important thing is that the model must be based on actuarial principles, a scientific approach 
based on actuarial professional standards as to the calculations and an analysis that goes into determining the rate. So when Eckler did the rate model review, he had a couple of key findings and then a bunch of recommendations for us. So in the key findings, the actuary found that the current rate model for setting employer premium rates is sound. It collects the right amount of money. And in fact, this is borne out when we um, calculate the premium rate that we need at the average board premium rate, it's the same, that $1.24 that we calculated in 2017 under the old model. When we run the new model, we come up with the same $1.24. So that tells us that at the board level, it was working fairly well. However, the actuary recommended that we needed to do several refinements to our model to better reflect current industry experience and current economic conditions. He also said that we had opportunity to improve some of aspects of accountability. So that means making rate codes more responsible for their costs, and as well to improve some of the aspects of collective liability, which kind of seems to contradict each other. But again, it's that balance between making rate codes responsible as well as what things should be shared amongst all employers. So we did not implement the new model in 2017. We needed time to educate and share information about the new model with employers and to talk, about, talk to stakeholders, employers, about how we might phase in or transition to this new model. Because at some rate codes, there are some significant increases or decreases. So the key recommendations um, are listed here, and we're going to go through all of them in quite in detail later on, except for classification. So Eckler recommended that the board establish a process to review the current classification and that the process ensure that we do classification reviews periodically. So currently we have 50 rate codes, and a number of those codes are fairly small. They have a few number of employers. Why is that a problem? The smaller the rate code, the less predictable our ability is when we look at the current cost to predict what the future is. So it's similar to statistical concepts where you need a large sample size in order to have confidence in the results that you get. So we have rate codes that are small and it's harder to use their results to predict the future. So that's why Eckler said you need to review your classification system to get more predictability in the size of the rate codes. However, this takes a lot of work, it's a lot of analysis, and a lot of consultation with employers. So the board has decided at this time that we would not implement this recommendation because to establish this process takes some time to do it right. So in the near and short term, we will use another part of Eckler's recommendations to kind of counteract the fact that we do have small rate codes. And I'll be talking about that when we talk about how we deal with credibility of industries. Um, again, I just wanted to remind you that Eckler did, uh, we have a report that he produced with respect to the rate model review, and that is online should you choose to read the whole thing. It's, some parts are kind of technical. Um, but it does have lots of really good information. So now we'll be going through <coughs> the industry impact components for each of the elements. So the industry impacts provided in this presentation are comparing the final 2017 industry premium rate to what the 2017 rate would have been had we implemented the new model. And again, I, I need to repeat this because these are not your 2018 rates. We're just intending to provide this information to educate on the model changes and provide 
what the potential impact could be to various rate codes. As I said before, there were some significant impacts on some rate codes, so we needed time to have these sessions, um, to reach out to employers, to, to share the information, and it's also to ask for your input around how we transition to the model. So the 2018 rates will be developed using the enhanced model and will, they're going to be different than what I'm showing you today because we'll be picking up another year of experience in terms of how we calculate uh, the future costs. So the first element that Eckler reviewed and, and provided a recommendation to us has to do with credibility. So what is credibility? It's credibility is the extent to which you can use past experience or past costs to predict what the future costs are going to be. And again, it's, sim it's similar to that statistical concept I talked about in classification. You need to have a fairly large sample size in order to have some confidence or reliability in the numbers that you're calculating. <coughs> and the concept of credibility is how we're going to counteract the fact that we do have small rate codes and the fact that we haven't implemented the classification uh, recommendation to periodically review and group rate codes together. So no rate, co no rate codes are changing now, but we will be using um, the recommendations under credibility to deal with that. So we do currently um, have a concept of credibility in the old model, but Eckler recommended a couple of changes to it to make it more um, fair and accountable. So the current model calculates credibility using premiums. And once we calculate that percentage of credibility for the industry, we supplement. So if you're not fully credible, if you're not 100% credible, if you're a smaller rate code, we supplement that experience for your industry with the experience of all 50 rate codes. So Eckler said that's not really um, a good practice because what happens in the S codes may be totally different than the M codes and so forth. So he said what you should do if five years, so under the current model we use five years of costs to predict what the future is going to be. And he said if you're a credible, not a credible uh, rate code, you're too small, you should expand the number of years to get more costs to increase that credibility. So Part of his recommendation was is that we move away from calculating credibility on premiums, that we move to calculating cre credibility based on cost, and where that calculation results in an industry code not being credible, that instead of using five years, you supplement that five years of experience with a portion of the 10-year experience. So I think the easiest way to explain this is to go through an example. Under the new method, you need approximately $16.5 million of, dollars of cost in a five-year period to be considered credible. If, when we run through the calculation, you're not credible, we'll supplement that with 10 years. So if an industry had, say, $10 million of cost in a five-year period, they would be approximately 60% credible. The way we would calculate um, that average cost that we're going to use to predict the future is we would take 60% of the five-year average and then add to that 40% of the 10-year average to come up with an average cost that we're going to use to predict what next year's costs are going to be. So if you're fully credible, we're just going to use that five-year period. If you're not fully credible, we're going to calculate the percentage, credibility, apply that to five years, and the resulting percentage to get to 
100% would be based on the 10-year experience. So this is, this is the change with respect to how we're doing credibility. We're now looking just to the industry's experience, not the board level, but we are increasing the time for less credible industries. So the result of changing this methodology, methodology with respect to credibility will take into account more of the industry's own experience to improve accountability and predictability, because you know what your costs have been. And also it achieves a reasonable balance between reflecting your recent experience and reducing volatility for small rate codes. And it removes that shift from relying on the experience at the board level or the experience of the other 50 rate codes to an industry's own experience. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? In general, rate codes that are negatively impacted by credibility are seeing an increase because their experience is worse than the board level experience, which lowers their costs under the current model, or their 10-year average costs are higher than their five-year average cost, would, which would increase their costs under the new model. Rate codes that are positively impacted by this change are seeing a decrease in that element of the rate model because their experience is better than the board level experience, which increase their costs under the current or the old model, or their 10-year average costs are lower than their five-year cost, which brings down their costs. So we're going to be going through the impact for each industry code individually here. So for S11, legal offices, financial, and drafting, the impact of changing the way we do credibility results in a one cent increase. Their experience is worse than the overall board experience, which decreased their costs used in the current model. Their 10-year costs are also higher than their five-year costs, so it increased the cost. So both elements impacted S11 by a total impact of one cent. S12, offices and professionals, it was a flat change. Um, so the experience for S12 is very similar to the overall board experience, so there was no impact there. And their ten, while their 10-year costs are a bit higher than their five-year costs, it was negligible. So it worked out to a flat impact. For S41, again, there's no change. And for a little bit different of a reason, um, their experience is worse than the overall board experience, which would have decre decreased their costs in the old model and their 10-year costs are low, sorry, which would have resulted in an increase in the new model, but their 10-year costs are lower than their five-year costs, which decrease, and these two things offset each other for a negligible impact. The other um, element of the model that ECLA reviewed and made recommendations on is the use of indicators to predict rates. And what he's talking about there is we have used the indicator of time loss claims and injury rate to predict future costs. So the current model uses the number of time loss claims as the key indicator of that industry's experience. While this may have been true in the 1990s when the model was first introduced, we've been noticing that it no longer was a good predictor of costs. With the emergence of a number of new trends, such as return to work, employer accommodation, <coughs> as well as medical becoming one of the primary drivers of costs, time loss claim counts no longer are the best predictor of what future cost experience will be. There are more severe claims in the system, they have longer durations, and they're costing us more. They're changing the cost structure of the claims. So while injury rates are coming down, our costs are remaining flat and slightly increasing. The 
time loss metric that we've been using in the old model as a projection for future costs just isn't correlating very well with what is actually happening with costs. So Eckler recommended that when we compare and try to project costs, rather than using what the time loss injury rate is telling us, that we should be looking at the evolution of the workforce to apply to that average cost number when we're trying to figure out what next year's costs are going to be. So the evolution of workforce is basically just an estimate of the change in the number of insured workers for, it, for the rate year. We've done back testing with, with this concept and the correlation between evolution of workforce and, and uh, our actual costs is in excess of 90%, which is a very, very strong correlation, indicating that using that workforce evolution is a much better way to predict our future costs. So what we'll be doing now is taking that average cost, and again, remember that average cost, depending on your credibility, will be your five-year average cost or a combination of your five and 10-year average costs, and applying the change in workforce in order to predict what the future costs would be. The other um, indicator that Eckler recommended we have a look at was that because we knew the model based on time loss counts was not project, uh, projecting the right uh, cost, we used to blend rates. So what that means is we would blend two years of rates to come up with the current year rate in order to ensure that we were collecting enough money and reduce volatility for the rate codes. Eckler said we need to discontinue that practice to increase that reactivity. So we were trying to um, provide some stability and predictability. He said, no, you need to be more reactive there. You need to let the rate model and the actual experience dictate the rate. So we were, predict we were promoting stability too much in the old model. So the impact of removing um, the indicators or changing the way we use indicators <coughs> in the new model for S11 has had a zero impact. Um, Using the workforce for S11 would cause the rate model to expect a slight increase in the claims liability that would be in line with the steady growth of the industry and would have increased S11's premium rate by less than a penny. And removing that averaging or the blending of the two years rates had an impact of less than a penny as well. It would have reduced by a penny so those two things offset for a zero impact. In S12, removing the blending had a been an impact of approximately a penny, so it would have decreased the rate by about a penny. However, adopting the workforce metric would have indicated that the costs would result in adding two cents. So that nets out to a one penny increase because the adoption of the workforce would say that costs are going up in S12. For engineering, testing, and surveying, the adoption of the workforce had a very, very slight decrease, less, less than oh, half a cent. So it had a neg neg negligible impact. However, uh, removing that blending of the two-year rates resulted in a one cent drop. So there's a one cent drop with respect to those two elements of indicators. <coughs> the next element that Eckler reviewed and made a recommendation on has to do with costly claim pooling or the capping of costs. So costly claim pooling is when costs are spread among a larger group of employers. For example, certain costs may be allocated at the rate code level in your risk pool, 
or amongst all employers. This increases collective liability so that a group of employers is not unfairly burdened. The current model, the way the current model works, we only cap or consider one element of compensation costs in the capping or the, the cost you claim cutoff, and that is pension costs. So the current model only looks at pension costs, and it looks at a fixed amount of $90,000 as being the cap. So once uh, pension costs for a, a claim exceed $90,000, they're capped, and those costs go into a pool. Currently, that pool is at the classification level. So it's not at the board level, it's at the classification level. And I'll maybe take it just a couple of seconds to review what that means. So in the current system, we have li collective liability at the board level, so that's all employers, all employers. Underneath that, we have classes, which are groupings of industry codes. We have 10 of those. There are 10 groupings of industry codes. <coughs> Excuse me. Underneath the classifications, there are 50 rate codes. So in the current rate model, we're sharing those capped costs just at the classification level. So for the S codes, there are nine rate codes. So costs in excess of that $90,000, excuse me, <clears throat> are shared just at that class. Eckler didn't think that that was a good uh, method to approach costly claims. He made um, several recommendations. So one was that we need to include all compensation costs when we look at the cost of a claim. So it would be pension, it would be compensation, it would be bulk rehab, medical, etc. So look at the comprehensive cost of a claim when you're looking at a cap. The other thing he said is to have um, really good collective liability, we should be pooling those costs above a certain maximum at a board level, not the classification level. So it should be shared amongst all employers, not just the ones in your classification. The other thing that he recommended is that we should move away from a fixed capping amount because over time the number ceases to have relevance. So he said what you should do is index your cap. And he recommended that we look at our maximum insurable earnings because it is now indexed and he recommended that you look at a range of three to five times the maximum insurable earnings to determine the cap. We did some analysis uh, at the board and determined that three times the maximum insurable earnings would be an appropriate cap and the board approved that. So for 2017, three times the maximum insurable cap is about $252,000. What this means is that costs for a claim, once they reach 252,000, will get pooled at the board level to be shared amongst all employers. So employers will be responsible for costs up to 252,000. After that, it goes into that big collective pool to be shared amongst all employers. What happens with the pool is that it, get, it will get allocated out to all rate codes based on their respective cost. So whatever their proportion of cost is of the whole board, they will assume that portion of the pool. The other um, point that I want to mention is that uh, we'll be reviewing what we're doing with fatalities, but fatality costs will also be included in this cost claim cap amount of 252,000. So the principles addressed here are that we're providing for better collective liability at the board level, rate predictability and stability by capping costs at 252,000, and accountability for industry up to that $252,000. So the industries will be accountable for their costs related to claims up to $252,000. So let's see what um, results for your S11, 12, and 41 because of this change. S11 will see a drop of a penny. 
So what's happening here, S11 had lower pension costs than the average sector S pension costs or classification S pension costs. So pension pooling used to increase their rate. So that is resulting in a decrease for that element of the calculation. However, they saw a slight increase in the cap under the new method, but the drop in the pension part offset the costly claims part of it by an impact of one cent. So pension pooling used to cost, but under the new method, there's claims that up to the 252, you'll be assuming more of that, but it nets out to a one set drop because you used to pick up, if you want to call it a disproportionate share of those pension uh, claiming under the old system. Same thing is happening in S12 for exactly the same reasons. You used to sh pick up more of the pension um, pooling because your average pension costs were lower in the old system. And S41 also has an impact of a drop of a penny for the same reasons. Pension, um, oh sorry, okay, I lied. So with S41, your average pension costs were lower under the average pension costs in the old system. However, costs in excess of three times the max are higher, therefore pooling of costly claims decreases your rate. And that nets out to a penny. So the next um, element of our rate model that Eckler looked at was how we treat fatality costs. Right now, every rate code is charged a 10-year average cost of all fatalities in the system, whether they had a fatality or not. Eckler said we need to increase accountability and we need to charge fatalities to the industries in which they occurred. He recommended that all costs from fatalities should be charged to the rate code in which they occurred and treated. Um, he, he suggested that we either charge them on an actual or average basis, but when the board considered this recommendation, they felt that fatalities were really no different than any other severe claim and we should be treating them like any other claim. So fatalities will now be treated just like any other claim and subject to the costly claim pooling. So industries will be responsible up to the $252,000 cost per fatality. After that, the cost will become pooled at the board level or shared amongst all 50 rate codes. This improves how we treated collective li how we treat collective liability as well as improves accountability for the cost of those claims. A thing to note though is that fatalities are not all the same in terms of cost. While tragic, um, they can have different cost implications. So the cost of a, a, a burial fee is quite insignificant, whereas the cost of a fatality where someone has a spouse and, and several children can exceed a million and a half dollars. So industries will still be protected in terms of they will bear the costs up to that $252,000 cap. After that, collective liability kicks in amongst all 50 rate codes and everybody shares in the cost of the expense of claim or the expense of fatality. So what is the impact on S11, 12, and 41? So for the legal and financial drafting code, uh, you're seeing a reduction of four cents. So that four cents that we charge you based on the 10-year average is basically coming off. You did have one fatality in the five-year averaging period, but the costs must have been very small because it's had a very neg well, a negligible impact on the rate code. 
in the Office and Professionals S12 code is also a four cent drop. Again, there was one fatality in the last five years in that code. However, again, the cost must have been small because it did not impact. And the whole four cents would be, relate to that, what we were charging you under the old model. S41, engineering, testing, and surveying, is seeing a decrease, but not of the whole four cents, only three cents. Now, this one is kind of interesting. So while there were no fatalities in the five-year, 2011 to 2015 period, which goes into the 2017 rate, this industry is only about 50% credible. So then we're picking up 10 years of the experience, and there would have been a fatality in that 10-year period that had costs attached that were significant enough to move this by a penny. The next element that um, Eckler recommended is that we look at long-term claims. So long-term claim costs, perhaps is a better way to say this. So currently, all costs, regardless of how many years ago they happened, are included in determining an industry's costs, either in that five or combination of five and 10 year average period. Some of those costs could be 50 years old, 30 years old, 20 years old, but we use them all right now. Eckler said this is not a good practice because some of those costs could have been related to claims for businesses that no longer exist or even, even that kind of job may no longer exist. Industry practices have changed with respect to prevention, and safety, there's been changes in technology which have changed jobs. And some of these really old costs really don't help us to predict what's gonna happen in the future. And he's saying you really, you need to cut them off at a point and not include them when we try to predict what the future is gonna be. So he recommended that we look at an appropriate period to cut the tail off those costs. So that means not include those old costs in those averaging periods to determine the future. We did some analysis and determined that seven years was the appropriate uh, length of time for which a cost should still impact the industry. And that the remaining 43 years of costs should get pooled at the board level. And that was Eckler's recommendation as well. He said, Make the industries responsible for the recent stuff. The really old stuff just goes into that collective liability at the board level to be shared amongst all rate codes. So what, what this means is if the costs are greater than seven years that we're using in that five or 10 year period, they're not charged to the industry code, they get charged to a pool that will be allocated out to all codes. So when we're looking at, if an industry is fully credible, we would be looking at the years 2011 to 2015 to calculate the average cost. We would only look at seven year old claims in each one of those years. So in 2011, we're only gonna include costs for the last seven years in 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15, so forth and the costs that are old, or related to claims that are older than seven years go into the pool to be shared. The sharing of those costs at the industry, like all industry level, at the board level, again, will be done based on the industry's proportionate share of costs of the whole system. So making this change will increase reactivity to, to recent experience and also improve accountability related to recent experience. So for S11, legal, financial, and drafting, S11 will be seeing a neg negligible, I have a hard time with that word, small, little, next to nothing impact with respect to this change. S11 has a similar portion of costs in the long term compared to the average, so pooling of those costs doesn't really impact S11. S11 
S12 will see, be seeing a one cent increase. There's less costs in the seven year old, but sorry, S12, sorry, S12 has a smaller portion of costs in the long term, so more costs are in that seven year. So pulling these costs would increase their rate by a penny. They're sharing, they're pushing less of their costs into the big pool. S41 is seeing a three cent increase, and again, that's for the same reason. They have lesser costs in that seven year, sorry, I'm getting this wrong. S41 has a smaller portion of costs in the long term, so they have less costs that are older than seven years, so they got more of their costs in that first seven years. That is pushing up their, their rate by three cents because they're sharing less with all 50 rate codes. So the last element um, that Eckler reviewed and made recommendations on has to do with how we allocate the board's administration expenses in the rate model. Administration costs are currently allocated based on both fixed and variable portions. And Eckler said, that's good that you're doing that because you have fixed costs and you have variable costs. However, when he looked at um, what we, the percentages we were using, he suggested that we do a review of that because it looked out of line to him. So when we reviewed our cost structure, we determined that we needed to increase the portion of our administrative costs that relate to fixed costs in terms of how we deal with this in the rate making model. So fixed costs are costs that the board incurs whether an injury happens or not. So these would be costs related to employer services for registering, a claim, uh, for registering as an employer, so forth. Costs related to um, HR, IT, finance, the board, the executive, um, people that aren't involved in processing claims. Whereas our variable claim costs relate to administration costs related to actually dealing with the claims. When we did that analysis, we discovered that our fixed costs are really at around 30%, not 10%, and that our variable costs are 70% and not 90%. So what this means is that, in general, industries with higher payroll and lower costs are going to be picking up a bigger portion of the fixed element of the administration cost. So for S11, this results in a six cent increase. So there's approximately a one cent decrease because of the change from 90 to 70% on variable, but a seven cent increase because, we are, because the rate code will be assessed more fixed cost for a net of six cents. Same thing is happening in S12. And in S41, the net impact, while their fixed component is also going up by seven cents, their variable component is going down by three cents for a net of four cents. So these last three slides show the ups and downs of all the element changes. And I just wanted to reinforce that the rate model is a dynamic system with many integrated moving parts and the number and changes to the elements we are showing are, are here to help explain why your rate is moving in the direction it is. These elements all work together and we can't um, pick and choose which ones we, we like or don't like without impacting the model as a whole and without impacting the board's need to collect premiums to cover all of the costs in the system. So for S12, the impact of all of these changes would be, would be a three cent 
increase to the rate had we implemented the model in 2017. The total impact for the rate code in terms of dollars is over $560,000, but divided by the 4,400 employers in this rate code works out to about a dollar, uh, not a dollar, $127 per employer. Oops, I was reading the wrong slide. I'm sorry, I'm just going to back up one. <clears throat> S11 legal offices, financial and drafting. The net impact is a two cent increase. The total impact is $127,000. When you divide that by the 569 employers, works out to $223 per employer. This is the one-time transition costs, and moving ahead, S11's experience would dictate what their rate would be. We had skipped ahead to office and professionals, and again, three cent increase. Total impact, $560,000 for the rate code, with 4,400 employers, works out to about $127 per employer for the one-time transition cost. For S41, it's a two cent increase. Total cost to the rate code of $120,000 divided by the almost 1,800 employers works out to about $68 per employer. So our next steps. So today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on wcbsas.com on the website. If you have questions after kind of digesting some of this stuff or if you think of something later that you don't ask today, we will be receiving questions through an email address. It's askwcb at wcbsas.com. And we are also requesting um, that we get feedback from employers with respect to how do we transition to this new model. We have a form online, again at wcbsas.com slash feedback, where you can provide your input as to how you think we should transition this model. And the board would really appreciate your feedback because they will use that in their decision. So this form will be open online until April 7th. We, are, we will be in Saskatoon next week, um, also doing some more presentations. And uh, so the form will be open for about a month after the close, until uh, we finish those presentations. So that is April 27th. Sorry, April 7th, April 7th. Um, so some of the options with respect to transition. We could do it all in one year. So just bite the bullet and, and implement the new model in 2018. <coughs> We could spread it over a couple of years. What that means is we would spread uh, or divide the impact of the transition over two years, uh, cost the impact to the rate code half of it in one, the first year, 2018, half in 2019. What that means though, if you're, if you're going up, it gets spread over two years, but if you're going down, it would also get spread over two years because we still have to collect the same amount of revenue as we did under the old model. There could be other options um, that you might think of with respect to how we transition. And in that feedback form, there's an open uh, field option where you could write down what that option is. So we have some time for questions now, and we'll also be entertaining uh, any questions that come from the people attending online. And just in closing, I'd like to remind you of the importance of injury prevention, that the least expensive injury never happens, and it's the easiest one to manage. We still are chasing that ultimate goal of mission zero, zero injuries, zero fatalities, zero suffering. And in fact, in 2016, 88% of our employers were injury free. We want to thank you for all of your efforts with respect to Mission Zero. 
and thank you for attending this seminar today. So we'll now open it up for questions, and if you could please go to the mic, so uh, because we are recording these questions and they will be available to those attending online. I think Kaylin has an online question for us. Yeah, and we've got a few questions from the webinar. Um, the first question is, under the new rate model, what percent of an employer's rate relates to board level allocations? And how does that compare to the same measurement under the old rate model? Board level allocations? Yeah, so how many, or what percentage of costs are in the pool in the new model? I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Do you understand the question? Uh, yeah, so 75% <laughs> in the new model, 75% of the costs are directly oh, charged okay. to the industry. Okay. So of, in the current model, and I don't know the math here, um, I believe the administrative component, if that's the question, is around 33 cents on the board average rate of $1.24. So what is that? Oh, I, think, I think it's the, the question is uh, what percentage of costs are directly come from the industry experience and what percentage of the rate is from the, their share of the pool from oh, all the other industries? Uh, oh, yeah. um, I, don't, I don't know if I know that. I think uh, with respect to the long-term claim pooling, 75, on average, 75% of the costs would be charged to the industry. And with respect to the costly claims pooling, I'm not sure I have that number, but we, we could get that number and get back to them. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the new model, I believe it's 25% uh, of costs in each industry's premium rate are coming from oh, okay. uh, everyone else's pooled costs. But okay. under the old rate model, uh, I'm not sure what that number would be offhand. So. Yeah, we'll have to get back to them on that one. Yep, yeah, for sure. I've got uh, another question here uh, as well. Um, so in Alberta, WCB is optional for an accounting office. Uh, is there a plan to do the same in Saskatchewan? Not that I'm aware of. And uh, is there a plan to reduce or eliminate WCB premiums if an employer provides proof of a wage replacement plan, such as uh, an alternative disability insurance? Uh, as far as I'm aware, the legislation does not provide for that mm -hmm. currently. And uh, then I got one last question here, uh, and that's what if we realize we're in the wrong industry code? What is the best way to check and how can that change be made? So I believe they should contact our employer services group and ask to have their classification reviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can provide a, a contact number to that person online and make that available to all. Sure. Call back to the yes. Sorry, the question was, who do we contact if we think we're in the wrong classification? And it would be the employer services group at WCB. Okay, so a little bit more information. We can directly email them at employer services at wcbsas.com. Is there any questions from the floor? Oh, I actually got one more online. Okay. Um, it it's, uh, has to do with the presentation. So it was about uh, slide 38. Um, they were wondering if you could explain the terminology around 2017 current versus 2017 enhanced. Uh, when can we expect rates for 2017 to move to the enhanced rate? Okay, so 27 current is the rate that was calculated, if you want to call it, on our current rate making model that was used. We did not change the model for 2017. So 2017 enhanced would be the calculations implementing all of the changes we talked about today. Pardon? If, sorry, if we had implemented in 2017, but we did not. So 27 in enhanced is the calculations under the new model for comparative purposes only. The 2018 rates 
We don't have the complete data sets in order to do them. They will be available in September, I believe, is when we send out the preliminary rates, September of 2017, this year. No. So the question was, uh, will the new model be retroactive to 2017? No, the new model would take an effect January 1st of 2018. So it would apply for the 2018 rate model year. 2017 rates are already calculated under the old. So there won't be a premium adjustment because of, of the new rate model for the 2017? No, no. 2017 is looked after. Ken, could you go to the mic? Then I don't have to try to repeat it. <laughs> Thanks. The one question I have at this time is what happens if uh, I'm looking at the, at the five year and 10 year averaging? Mm -hmm. So uh, you indicated that credibility was kind of based on $15.5 million of costs over a five-year period. Yeah, 16 and a half million. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then if there was, wasn't that figure in five years, then we would go to 10 years. What happens if we don't have that kind of figure at 10 years? Uh, we're just going to the 10-year period. Okay. So All regardless right. whether or not you get up to the 16 and a half, we go but, to the 10-year period. Now, the, the other one that comes up with this is, uh, I just find it interesting that we're, while working towards Mission Zero, we're basing our forward uh, predictability of rates on costs. Sooner or later, we should be getting to zero cost. I How agree. How do we do our predictions then? <laughs> I agree, but that's not been our experience. Um, so the, the claims that are left in the system are really persisting longer and costing more. And that's why our costs are not following um, the reduction in injuries. So a lot of that is due to really good return to work efforts. You know, we're, we're, we're getting people back to work, but there are still people being hurt that have to be off a long time and they're costing us more. So it's, it's changing our cost structure in terms of we have more expensive claims in the system now. So on slide 17, it talks about changing um, the predicting costs based on time loss claims versus now using a um, workforce. change of workforce. Yeah. Is there going to be any change in how our surplus or um, surcharge and discount? No. So we're going to calculate to get to that base rate with the new model. Um, the experience rating program was recently reviewed and there was a slight change there with the increase to the 21,000 to determine whether an employer fell into the standard or advanced program, but there is no, no changes contemplated there. So the experience rating program, this does not impact the experience rating program. Any more questions online, Kaylin? So again, if you should think of something uh, after you've had a bit of time to digest this, please email us at the uh, email address on the last slide and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And again, I'd like to thank you very much for coming out today and to thank the people online as well. Thank you.